Hey, everybody. Come on in. We're about two minutes before class starts. So y'all can ask me questions now or you can wait till we start. So I don't know what's going on, but my access to Pearson has just disappeared on Canvas. I assume it's happened to you guys, too. So I don't know what to do with that, but hopefully I can still access your homework. All right, it's about time to start. I'm going to give it a minute or so just in case anybody else is coming. I'm going to try to send an email off to the help desk. Still working on sending that email. Hold on, everybody.
Okay, I sent an email to the people that are supposed to be responsible for it. I have no idea whether that's going to actually work or not, but here we are. Uh, does anybody, uh, if you're in your Canvas right now, are you seeing a link up in the top left that says Pearson or MyLab and Mastering? It used to say some Eastern Shore thing. No, it's been gone. I checked um, this morning. I didn't see it. I was wondering about that. When did it disappear for, or when did you first notice it disappeared? I, I think I used it yesterday, but I did not see it this morning. Okay. Yeah, I used it today, uh, it, but it was in a different class, but I still used it on blackboards. I mean, on Canvas, so it should still work. I don't know what's going on, but that's okay. I, I've prepared despite that. The the downside is we got to figure out how to crack you off and get back to your homeworks or else, you know, that's not very helpful. So uh, I will see what I can find out about that. Of course, we haven't covered, actually, I need to look at the chapters to even remember what number of chapters we've covered. Let me check that real quick. Uh, when we were last together, we almost finished chapter 25. There was one uh, example left in chapter 25 that I want to work, and that's what I'm getting ready to do now. And then we'll go through very specific examples in chapter 26. Uh, and I'm skipping very specific parts, like parts I love, like making an ammeter and a voltmeter out of a galvanometer. But I'll be skipping that. And then... Uh, if we are lucky, we'll have enough time where I can at least give you the equations that are related to chapter 27, because it's pretty straightforward, uh, other than the integral process, which I could work next time. So let's go ahead and get started. Does anybody have any questions before we do so? Okay, looks like we're good to go then. Uh, I am just going to share my iPad screen that should pop up there any minute now. And this that shows is the example that I hadn't worked from chapter 25. So just remember, this is chapter 25. And what it says is a copper wire has a diameter of 3.50 millimeters. It carries a current of five amps. What is the electric field in the wire? Now, this might seem a little abstract because you don't know any equations about it, but that's just because I haven't done the derivation uh, that I was going to do. So I'm going to do that as part of the solution. What we know is that Ohm's law says V is equal to IR. Uh, what we also know is that you could say, for instance... Actually, hold on a second. Let me make sure I get back where I am. Still trying to work through the book here. Uh, there's that. Okay. Now, what I'm going to use for all this stuff is, and then get this back, uh, uh, V for any voltage. Uh, if we want to calculate a voltage, over some distance L in a uniform electric field, we know that the voltage is equal to the electric field yeah. times L, the length over which we wish to uh, find the potential difference. So for instance, if you have a, a constant electric field and you go a distance of three meters, the voltage difference from one end to the other is the electric field strength times three meters. We also have R is equal to rho L over A, where A is the cross-sectional area. And we also have that I is equal to J times A, where J is the current density. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say J is equal to the current divided by the amperage. And the current is five, or excuse me, divided by the uh, area. And the current is 5.00 amps, and the area is pi times, remember it's normally pi r squared, but we can also use pi d squared over 4, and that's what I'm going to use. So I'm going to say pi times 3.50 times 10 to the negative 3, uh, that one should be in meters, that's going to be squared. 
And then, of course, it's pi d squared over 4, so I'm going to multiply the 4 on top. And when I do this, I get 5 times 4, which is obviously 20. And then I take 20 and divide it by 3.50 e to the negative 3. And I square that number. And that gives me 1.633. Oops. 1.633 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1.63 times 10 to the 6 amps per square meter. Uh, that should have three sig figs. So really this extra three is there. Now I can take all those equations, uh, Ohm's law, V equals E, L, R equals rho, L over A, and I equals J over A. Yeah. And I can change the equation. So V equals I, R becomes E times L is equal to uh, J times A for I times rho L over A for the R. And from this, you can see that the A cancels out with the A, the L cancels out with the L, and ultimately we're just left with this result, which says that E is equal to rho times J. So that's why I went ahead and took the time to calculate J, the current density. So now I can take E and say it's equal to rho. Now rho is the conductivity, and this is a copper wire, so rho is equal to 1.68 times 10 to the negative 8 ohm meters. That's in a table in our book. Uh, you could also Google it, but the main thing is the book gives you a table for a reason. So I'm going to put 1.68 times 10 to the negative 8 ohm meters uh, times J, which is 1.633 times 10 to the 6 amps per square meter. So you can see the amp times an ohm is going to give you a volt and the meter squared divided uh, under the, or the meter divided by the meter squared is going to give a per meter. So we get a result of amp, uh, volts per meter, which is exactly the units for the electric field. So 1.633 times 10 to the 6 times uh, 1.68 e to the negative 8. Multiply that, I get 0 0.02743 volts per meter. Now, notice how small that is. When we were looking at the electric field between parallel plates and a parallel plate capacitor, we were getting tens of thousands of volts per meter. Yeah. One example in your book, for instance, had 25,000 volts per meter was the electric field strength. In a conductor, you don't need nearly as strong of an electric field because the electrons are just free to move around because it's a conductor. And that's what this uh, shows us is that the electric field need not be very large, even to carry a very large current of five amps. Anyone have any questions on that? Uh, where did you get the four in the calculation for the uh, current density? Uh, basically from pi area is equal to pi r squared, and then r is d over 2. So that becomes pi d squared over 4. I see. Okay. Yeah, sometimes it just saves you a little bit of trouble putting a 4 up top. So. so that ends chapter 25. And we're moving on to chapter 26. Now, chapter 26, again, since I don't have the, <laughs> the ability to access the Pearson website, I will tell you chapter 26 is called DC Circuit. <clears throat> it's called DC Circuits, and it covers EMF and terminal voltage, 
electromotive force is what EMF is, and terminal voltage is the voltage uh, between the positive terminal and the negative terminal of any kind of power source, like a battery, for instance. If you put a uh, the red lead from the V omega port on a multimeter, if you put that on the positive terminal of a AA battery, for instance, and then put the black lead, which is in the COM terminal, on the negative terminal of the battery, that voltage that it reads is called the terminal voltage. <laughs> if you do that with a battery fresh out of the box, a AA has a nominal voltage. It's supposed to be 1.5, but when they first when you first buy them, they might have a voltage as, as low as 1.65 or as high as 1.72 or something like that volts instead of the 1.5. And what happens is when you connect that battery to an actual uh, load, then it's going to draw a current and it, we pretend as if the battery is made up of an ideal battery which has no no really under no chemical composition or anything like that that we have to worry about it just has a set voltage and we pretend like it's always going to be that voltage and then we stick that inside of a real battery and inside that real battery in addition to that made up perfect battery is an internal resistance and since that internal resistance is there, we know that V equals IR tells us there's going to be a drop of V across that literal internal resistance R. Therefore, <sighs> when you connect the battery and draw a current, you get something other than that 1.68 or 1.65 volts to the 1.72 volts. You might get closer to 1.5. And uh, that's what that's about. Uh, it then goes into resistors in series and parallel. I'm going to restate those formulas, but you need not uh, you need not necessarily uh, memorize them because I think you already know them from your labs. Uh, basically, the resistances in series has a equivalent resistance equal to R1 plus R2 plus however many resistors there are. But if you have resistors in parallel, uh, the total resistance is. Uh, smaller than the smallest resistance in this in the parallels uh circuit uh in fact what it equals is one over r equivalent parallel is equal to one over r1 plus one over r2 plus one over r3 plus dot 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 for as many resistors as you have so now you can see exactly what we're talking about in terms of uh the formulas uh, actually, I didn't realize. I just looked up and noticed that, that when I flipped to the Pearson book, you're actually able to see that. So you can see Chapter 26 DC circuits. Uh, Kirchhoff's rules are really what I care about. Uh, EMF and terminal voltage, resistors in series and parallel. Those are things that I suspect you already know about uh, just from doing your labs on Ohm's law and series and parallel. Kirchhoff's rules are the main thing. And then I'm going to use that to solve uh, circuits in general. So I'm going to do that, uh, well, not the next example, but two examples after that. And then I'm going to do RC circuits. And I'm just going to give you those results and show you how they're used. And I'm going to skip 26.6 and 26.7. I, I will try to get those out of the practice test, but I suspect I'll miss some of them. So don't worry too much about seeing them in the practice test. I think it's great that you figure out how to do uh, how to create an ammeter or, or voltmeter with a galvanometer. Uh, so I don't mind that being a homework, but I'm not going to test you on it. Uh, that being said, you should be trying to read the entire book so you can get some information, background information, for instance, about uh, electronic circuits and, and how batteries are made and all that kind of stuff. So it gives you a lot of facts that are relevant. So at least reading it will help you be a little more familiar. You can see it has this uh, chapter opening question. That's actually the example I'm going to work first. But basically, it's like you have two car headlights connected to a 12-volt car battery. There's two ways you can connect it in series and in parallel. And they're wanting to know which way gives you the most light, assuming the two batteries are, uh, the, are the two headlights are the same. So let me kill this, go back to my uh, examples. So we're now ready to go to chapter 26. And this is the example I just finished telling you about. I said the amount of light produced by a headlight or light bulb is directly proportional to the power dissipation of the bulb. Show which configuration below yields the most light. So what I mean by this is uh, 
for instance, if you have an incandescent bulb, we know that the power dissipated is this, you know, big number, like a hundred watt incandescent bulb dissipates a hundred watts of power, but it's not uncommon to find that, you know, 2% or 10% or 18% of that is actual light. The other, you know, remaining hundred percent is all just heat. If you get a compact fluorescent light and it says uh, equivalent to 100 watt, what they mean is it's as bright as 100 watt, but it'll draw like 20 watts or something like that. So in that case, the 20 watts is maybe it's not still not 100 percent, but it'd probably be high times 0.98 or something like that. But that type of light will have consistently a factor of 0.98, whereas a uh, 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 incandescent light will probably consistently have something like uh, 0.9 uh, as the heat and therefore only 0.1 as the actual light. So you have to multiply every light by 0.1 of the incandescent, incandescent variety to get what light is emitted. So if we just work with the P, the formula for power, we can get a measure that's comparable or at least proportional to the amount of light that comes out. So I am assuming the two lights are identical. What I'm going to do first is I am going to consider this in parallel. And what we know is that power is equal to I times V. Okay, so I is the current going through the device and V is the voltage across the device. What we can see for the two light bulbs is uh, the voltage for one is equal to the voltage for two. And let me clarify, I'm going to call this one, say, one. And let's call this one, two. Then I'll call this one, one, and this one, two. So voltage of one is equal to the voltage of two. And they're both, of course, equal to just the voltage of the battery. That's what it means to be in series, right? And now the current has gotten another way. What we know is that uh, V is equal to IR for the entire circuit. So in this case, I got to talk about R equivalent. Well, these two resistances are in uh, parallel. And what that means is one over R equivalent is equal to one over R plus one over R, which is equal to two over R, oops. Don't know what I wrote there. So that means R equivalent is equal to R over two. So now I can plug this back into here and say I times R over two. And that tells us that I is specifically equal to two V over R. So now I can say the power for one bulb, bulb is I1 times V1, and we already know V1 is just V. Now we know I1 and, of course, I2 are the same as well. So we're going to say 2V over R times just V, because 2V over R is the I and V is the voltage. So we get 2V squared over R is the power for one bulb, for the other bulb, bulb it's also going to be 2V squared over R. So P total parallel is going to be equal to 4V squared over R. So we know it's like some number times that, but whatever that number is, that's going to come out to be the same thing on the other circuit. So we have this right now. Now I'm going to take the same tactic for this series one, what I'm going to say is R equivalent is equal to R plus R, which equals 2R. Then I'm going to say V is equal to I times R equivalent. And that means that I is equal to V over 2R. Because I plugged in 2R for R equivalent. And then I divided both sides by uh, 2R and got V over 2R is equal to I. Now P1, oh, I should also say uh, V1 is equal to one half V, but that's also equal to V2. Just by symmetry, 
the fact that they are identical and the fact that they're in series means the voltage is going to step down by half across the first light bulb and then by half again across the second light bulb. So now I can say that P1 is equal to I1 V1, uh, but I is going to be V over 2R, and V is going to be V over 2. So I'm going to get V squared over 4R. P2 is going to be the same thing, V squared over 4R. So P total is equal to V squared over 4R plus V squared over 4R, which equals 2V squared over 4R, which equals V squared over 2R. And this is for the series one. So what we can see is P parallel is actually equal to eight times P series. Because if you multiply eight times the series one, you get eight divided by two is four, and that's exactly what it is. So uh, clearly the parallel provides more light. by a factor of eight. So that's a really huge difference. Any questions on that one? So this did require us to use V equals I R. It required us to use the power formula, which remember the, the P equals I V is the true power formula that works for anything. Whereas the I squared R or the V squared over R only works for objects that act like resistors, basically. In other words, you have to have a resistance for it. So uh, hopefully that makes some sense to you. Anybody have any questions on that one? So really what's going on here, when you put them in parallel, one, both bulbs get full voltage across them. So the V is going to be twice as big already. Two... Since the two resistors are in parallel, the total resistance of the two bulbs is even smaller than even one of the bulbs. In fact, it turns out to be R over 2 when the resistance of one bulb is just R. So since the resistance is going to be R over 2, that means the current can be twice as large. So the voltage can be twice as large. Uh, the current can be twice as large. That gets you a net, net factor of like 4 roughly. Now, what you actually see is when you calculate it all, it turns out to be a factor of eight, assuming I didn't make any careless mistakes. And that's because when you put them in series, they have to half the voltage. And in fact, the current uh, is going to be split down to basically a current uh, that goes through both of, the, uh, both of the light bulbs. And it's beholden to basically a resistance that's twice as big, actually four times as big as resistance in parallel, because this is going to be 2R and the other one was R over 2. So uh, you actually have four times as much resistance, therefore you have a fourth of the current going through it. So all of that spells that the uh, way to connect uh, light bulbs, if you want the light, most light is to put them in parallel. Any questions? All right, we're going to move on to the next one. So what I had warned you guys about or told you guys about is that when you have a battery, we look at a battery as if there's an ideal battery inside of it. And that ideal battery just means it has a set voltage. And you don't have to think in, in uh, over time that that ideal battery is going to decay or maybe lose the ability to make current and to make charge and stuff like that. Because we know from reading the last chapters as well as this one, that that's what happens to batteries over time. For instance, the zinc, uh, the zinc terminal will lose zinc atoms slowly but surely as a result of the acid. And when the zinc atoms fall off of the zinc terminal, the uh, remaining electrons stay on the zinc terminal and the zinc terminal becomes a negative terminal, uh, assuming you're grouping it with, uh, with carbon for the other terminal. 
So uh, that's really what happens with a battery. But with an ideal battery, we just say, no, it's 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 some magic and it's going to be 12 volts forever, <laughs> right? And then we put in series with that a little resistance. And you can do experiments to estimate what that is. And it's just a model. It's not, not necessarily true that it's like that. But the main thing is that the fact that you get good results that you can use in a predictive way is all that matters. It doesn't mean it matter what the real effect is. If it acts like it, it's just as good as being it. So let's do this one. And here's the problem we're trying to do. And this one, it says a 100 ohm resistor is connected to a 12 volt battery with a 0 0.700 ohm internal resistance. What is the total current and the series circuit B, what is the terminal voltage of the battery? And C, how much power is dissipated in each resistor? So I'm going to go ahead and draw the circuit for you so you understand. And I'm going to go a little bit further than that and draw it as if it's a real battery. So let's imagine, for instance, this could be like a, a C battery, say. So this is what a C battery would look like in real life. What I'm saying is inside of there, we're going to imagine a simple ideal battery like this. And then we're going to imagine an internal resistance like little r here. And uh, in this case, I'm going to say this EMF for this battery is 12.0 volts. That's for the ideal battery. And then this resistance R is 0 0.700 ohms. Now from this, a wire is going to come out and it's going to go to a resistance. And then you've got to have a home route back where you can pretend like the battery is actually releasing positive charges into the wire. And then it has to have a return path for the positive charges to come back into the negative side of the battery. If not, you don't have an actual circuit. So up here, I'm going to say R is equal to 100.0 ohms. And remember, that's just what I use to make sure everybody knows the zero just before the decimal is a sig fig. Now, we do know that resistors in series, which is what's going on here, just add. So we can use Ohm's law, which says V equals I times R to say 12.0 volts is equal to I times 100.700 ohms. Now, obviously you see that 0.7 is not that big a deal. And in fact, the 0.7 is not even really supposed to be a sig fig because the 0 0.0 was not a sig fig on the 100 ohms. But the main thing is we now have the current, and the current would be equal to 12.0 volts divided by 100.700 ohms. And when I do that math, I'm going to say 12 divided by 100.7, and that gives me 11.917. Uh, excuse me. I don't know why I said 11. That's weird. Never had my brains do that before. It's... <laughs> It's 0 0.11917 amps. Now, we actually had three sig figs divided by three sig figs. So this one and the seven are not right. So I'd really call that probably 119 milliamps. But that's okay. That's the main question. Uh, that's the part A that we're going for. So I'll box that off and say that's the answer to part A. Does that make sense to everyone? That's supposed to be like a real chucker problem. Uh, and in fact, whenever you have two resistors in series with a battery, the two resistors is called a voltage divider. And that's what this is. This one's a little weird, though, because one of them's inside of a battery, so you wouldn't really normally call that a voltage divider. 
what the beauty of a voltage divider is, is you can adjust the two resistors to adjust the voltage across each one so you can get whatever voltage you want. That's the advantage of a voltage divider, and that's the basis of how you make a, a voltage source like a power supply or something like that. Now, for part B, they want to know what's the terminal voltage. Now, what I'm going to tell you is there's this neat way where you can check the voltages at spots, and that's what I like to do. So let's just imagine for a second that we have a voltmeter, a multimeter right here. Okay, so this is our multimeter. This is our V omega port. And this is our COM port. Now we have a dial on it where we select things and I'm gonna put this on V. Notice it has a series of dots above it and then a straight line. That means DC voltage. If it had a sine wave over it, it'd be an AC voltage. And this is where the display will show us the voltage since I have it set to voltage like that. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and run a wire from the COM port. to this spot right here, which is the negative terminal of the battery, which you could also say is that spot right there because obviously the resistance of the wire is minimal and that small distance makes it even more so, okay? Now, the other thing I can do is I can now take the red wire and put it anywhere I want. And when I put that red wire somewhere, that'll tell me what the voltage is there relative to ground. So for instance, if I put the red wire, let's say right there, it would read zero. If I put it anywhere between there, it would also read zero because we're going on the assumption that uh, yeah, there might be some current flowing, but the resistance of the wire is so close to zero, we couldn't measure it even with our multimeter, okay? In reality, if we had a multimeter that could measure to 50 decimal places, obviously we would find it. And then I would want to put the black terminal all the way up the, uh, to that black dot right next to the little short side of the battery. But since we're ignoring that, it doesn't matter whether the black terminal is put there or at the black dot, okay? Everybody understand that, what I'm saying there? Okay, so uh, the way I would go about measuring the voltage at another spot, for instance, the terminal voltage, I would want to put the, the red terminal at the, or excuse me, the red wire at the other terminal of the battery. So now what I'm going to do is put my red wire, and sometimes you got to be a little pedantic about it. I'm going to show it jumping this wire so you don't think they're one and the same. So that's just a nice little convenience to keep people from getting confused about circuit diagrams. Now I'm going to run this right wire way up here, and now I'm going to touch it right there. When I do that, that's reading V terminal. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Anywhere I touch that red, if I kept that black there, though, a little bubble will pop up. So, for instance, if I want to take my little red bubble and put it right here, I'm going to read this as 12.0 volts. So, those bubbles are really helpful. It can just tell me what the voltage is. I can see that this one's going to be 0, 0.0 volts. I can see that this one's going to be 0, 0.0 volts. Again, if I was really measuring it to an infinite number of decimal places, probably I would find that the voltage up there at, next to that resistor is probably 0. 0.00001 or something like that, really, really small, because current is flowing through it, and current flows from high voltage to low voltage. So technically, for current to flow, the, the voltage at the edge of the resistor must be slightly, slightly higher than the voltage at the negative terminal of the battery. OK, now uh, what I know is that according to Ohm's law, that little resistance R is going to have a voltage drop that is equal to, according to Ohm's law, V is equal to I times little r. 
that means it's going to be uh, 0 0.11917 amps times 0 0.700 ohms. When I multiply those, I get 0 0.08342. 0 0.08342 volts is the voltage drop. Now, I'm only allowed to have three sig figs from this, so I have to put an underline there. But that's the voltage drop. Now, that's the voltage drop. It's key to understand that. So now if I put the bubble uh, right where the V-terminal is measuring, you can see that the bubble is going to read the actual terminal voltage. So, oops. So I'll put a bubble right here. And that's going to read the voltage. Now, what I'm doing is I'm going to take 12.0 volts and I'm going to subtract from it 0 0.08342 volts. And I'll get 11.9166 Now, obviously, I don't have any more decimal places. And in fact, uh, because I only have one decimal place on the 12 volts, this 166 are all non-significant digits. So that's what the terminal voltage is. We're going to say the terminal voltage is 11.9 volts is V terminal. I'll just uh, abbreviate that T-E-R-M. Any questions on that? Now, with that, you can also say put a bubble right here, and then that bubble would actually still have the same voltage and so on and so forth. So that comes in handy. I, I definitely recommend you use it as necessary. It'll help you. Uh, but now we've done two parts of the problem. Let's go ahead and finish the other part. They want to calculate uh, how much power is dissipated in each resistor. So for part C, I'm going to say... P in big R is equal to, uh, we can do P equals IV, or we can do uh, P equals I squared R. That's the one I like because I have the R and I've already calculated I, so I'm going to use P equals I squared R. That I is 0 0.1196. Amps that's going to be squared times 100.0 ohms, and I get PR is equal to 0.11917 squared times 100, which you don't even have to do, is 1.420. Let's say 0, 1, 4201 watts. Now, this is only three sig figs, so I have to underline those two, but that's the power dissipated in the load resistance, which is the 100 ohms. Any questions on that one? Similarly, P sub little r is going to equal I squared times little r. So again, that's going to be 0.11917 amps squared times 0 0.700 ohms. So P sub little r is going to be 0 0.009941. 0 0.009941 watts. And that's going to be the power dissipated by the internal resistance. Any questions on that? All right. So now what I got to teach you is Kirchhoff's loop rule and Kirchhoff's junction rule. I know some of you possibly have already had uh, circuit analysis or you're taking it now or something like that. We use a very straightforward method in physics. If we take, uh, well, you can't actually take uh, 
electronics for engineers. That's luckily I was able to get one of those courses in, uh, which helped me deeper understand electronics a lot more. But anyways, you know, the typical book used for that is one written by Simpson. There's another one written by, I can't think of it right now. I have a copy of it. Horowitz, I think it is. Yeah, I don't have it on the bookshelf right now. But yeah, Horowitz is another one. So Simpson and Horowitz are two different authors that have written engineering electronics books uh, that are very good. But what we use here is Kirchhoff's junction rule, which basically says if you add up all the currents coming into a junction and then you add up all the currents leaving that junction, then the those two sums should be equal to each other. That's Kirchhoff's junction rule called KJR or KJL, okay? And that really is a conservation of charge because you can imagine if you had, for instance, one wire coming in and two wires coming out, then if, if the wire coming in brought 200 coulombs of charge every second, and one of the wires going out brings uh, takes 150 coulombs away from it every second. You know the other one has to have 50 coulombs per second coming out of it. So that's just a conservation of charge thing. Kirchhoff's loop rule, however, says if you go around in a complete loop in any circuit, in other words, you start on one place and you go around the circuit any way you want, doesn't really matter, long as you end up back at the exact same spot, if you do that and add up all the voltage increases and de decreases, then the net sum of all those increases and decreases will be zero. That's basically equivalent to saying uh, the closed integral of uh, E dot DL is equal to zero. That's really just the same thing. So again, we see that's a conservation of energy as opposed to a conservation of charge. So it's easiest to make that make sense to you by actually applying it. So I have an example here. You'll notice I actually took a photograph of the circuit that the book is using, and I'm going to solve this particular circuit. OK, so what I want to do first is I'm going to apply Kirchhoff's junction rule. And the way Kirchhoff's junction rule works is this. I'll say that's probably good enough. And let's say this one, this one, and this one is I1, I2, and I3. And then this guy is I4. This one's I5. And this one is I6. So this would tell you that I1 plus I2 plus I3 is equal to I4 plus I5 plus I6. So notice all I did was took the time to draw arrows to show the, the wires that are going in, meaning I've chosen the currents to be pointing in, and then I've drawn arrows to show the currents going out, and I summed up the ones going in and I summed up the ones going out, and I set them equal to each other. That's all Kirchhoff's junction rule is. So if we look at junction, let's say junction D in the figure, what we see there is I1 comes into it, and I2 comes into it, and I3 comes out of it. So I'm going to say I1 plus I2 is equal to I3, and I'm going to call that equation 1. If you look at junction A, by the way, you're always going to have one extra junction. So if this one has two, that means one's an extra. But if you look at junction 1, you would get I3 is equal to I1 plus I2, which is exactly the same equation. That's why you always have one extra. Now I'm going to look at Kirchhoff's loop rule. So let's say Kirchhoff's loop rule. And I'm going to say for the top loop. Which is going to be, let's say I start at C. Yeah, let's say I start at C and I go to B and then to A, and then to H, and then to D, and then back to C. 
So that tells you not only what loop I'm doing, but it also tells you which direction I'm going. Now, here's the point, and this is the big part. So uh, hear me out, and I'm not writing this down in sentence form, so you might want to. I'm just trying to save time here, so I, I, I can't afford the time to write it out in sentence form. But when you go in the same direction of a current, then all resistances are voltage drops. If you go in the opposite direction of a current, all the resistances are voltage increases. If you go in the direction of the current, a resistance is a voltage drop. If you go in the direction that's opposite the current, then all resistances are voltage increases. Now, the trick is, in this case, they actually gave you I1, I2, and I3 and specified which directions they're going. I, I wouldn't necessarily do that. If I gave you this problem, I would say label the three nodes uh, with a current name and then solve for all of those currents. So you get to choose your direction and everything as well as the names. And then you can choose whether you're going with the current or against the current. So now that we, we know that, I'm going to show you what I mean. Notice in going from C to B to A, I'm going the same direction as the current. So cur resistors are voltage drops. And I use V equals IR to calculate the voltage drop. So what I see is a minus 1 times I3 minus 40 times I3. Now, again, going across the top, I'm going the same direction as I1. So I'll say minus 30 I1. Now I get back to D, and now I'm going uh, from D towards C. I'm going from the short leg of the battery to the long leg. So that's a voltage increase. So I'll call that plus 45. Notice I left the units off and everything. Now I'm back at C, so I go ahead and write equals zero. I can simplify this because obviously I3 appears twice, so I can combine like terms. And what I'll say is 45 minus 41 I3 minus 30 I1 is equal to zero, and I'm going to call that equation two. Now I'm going to do the outer loop. So Kirchhoff's loop rule, outer. And in this case, I'm going to go, let's say, from D to E to F to G to A to H and back to D. Okay, so starting from D, if I go down, notice I'm going the opposite direction of I2 because I2 is supposed to go down this way and then that way, but I'm going that way. So this first 20 ohms is going to be a voltage increase. So I'm going to say plus 20 times I2 plus 1 times I2, that's for the 1 ohm resistance. Now I'm going from F to G, I have to go from the long leg of the battery to the short leg, so that's a voltage drop minus 80 volts. Now I go up to A, nothing happens, I go all the way up. Now I'm going the direction of I1 around the top part, so since I'm going the direction of one uh, of I1, the 30 ohms is a voltage drop. So I'll say minus 30 times I1. And now I'm back at D. So I'll say equals zero. I can, again, combine like terms. And this time I'm going to say 20 I1 20 I1. I think that's supposed to be a one that I drew next to the one. I know it's supposed to be, but it doesn't look like a one, does it? So that's I1 as well. So now that I've realized that, I can call that 21 I1. So I'm, whoa, Nelly. 
So I'm going to say 21 I1 minus 30. I, well, I darn it. No, it's not I1. It was I2. That's what it was. Ah, minus 20 minus 1. So this is I2. And then it's 30 I1 minus 80 is equal to 0. And that's equation 2. Everybody, make sure you get your, your I's straight. Notice when I started at D, I was doing that bottom leg, and that current was supposed to be I2. I don't I don't know what happened, why I wrote I1 in one case and I2 in the other. But anyways, that, that works now. Uh, anybody have any questions on that? So I do have 41 total for I3. That's the total resistance is a 40 and a 1, so that makes me feel good. For I2, I should have a total resistance of 21. That's what I got. That makes me feel good. And for I1, I should just have 30. That's what I got in both cases, so that makes me feel good. Now, what I've decided works quite well is the way I did this, I have I3 and I1 in equation 2, and I have in equation, dang it, I also labeled equation 3 as equation 2 like I didn't already have a 2. So this is equation three, everybody. Please make that correction. Don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Anyways, so notice I can say solve equation two for I3 and get a, a expression for I3 only in terms of I1. I could also solve I3 for I2 only in terms of I1. And that's what I'm going to do. So if I solve this one for I3, I'm going to get I3 is equal to, notice when I put it over to the other side, it becomes 41 I3 positive. So I'm going to say this is 45 minus 30 I1, and then I'm going to divide all that by 41. And now I can break this up by calling it 45 divided by 41, which is 0.833, I think. Nope, that's one. Oh, no, that's the other one. 1 1.09. Eight. So I'm going to say this is 1.098 minus, now I do 30 divided by 41. I think that's the 0.833. Nope, that's not it either. I don't even know where I remember that number from. All right, so this is 0.7317. So I'm going to say minus 0 0.7317 I1. So this equation is going to be called two prime. Now, in reality, uh, all of these really only have, I'm going to pretend like everything's two sig figs. So 45 divided by 41 should only give you two sig figs. And 30 divided by 41 should only give you two sig figs as well. Now I'm going to do the same thing to equation three, only this time I'm solving for I2. So notice the I2 is already positive where it is. So I'll leave it there. That means I'm going to pull the 80 to the other side. It'll become positive. And then the 30 I1 will also be positive. So that's going to be 30 I1. And then I got to divide all that by 21. And then, of course, 80 divided by 21 is equal to 3.80 or 3.810. And then 30 divided by 21 gives me 1.429. And that's I1. So let's make sure all our signs are working because I did make a mistake on this when I worked in a problem like this for my students the other day and I just haphazardly had a plus instead of a minus. So when I solved for I3, I put that on the other side. That should have gave me a positive 45 and a negative 30. That's what I got. So I feel good about that. When I left I2 on the left, that should have gave me a positive 80 and a positive 30. I'm okay with that. So this equation is going to become 3 prime. Now what I'm going to do is plug 2 prime and 3 prime into 1. So plug 2 prime and three prime into equation one. The reason why we do that is uh, 
my two prime and three prime are only functions of I1. So if I plug it in for I2 and I3, I'm just going to have one equation with one unknown and I can go ahead and solve for I1. And then I can use these other expressions to solve for I2 and I3. So the first expression, of course, is just I1. Then I've got plus I2. Well, I2 turned out to be 3.810 plus 1.429. I1, and then that's I1 plus I2. That's equal to I3, and I3 is 1.098 minus 0.7317 I1. So we can see that I've got like 2.4 I1 on the left, and if I pull the other I1 over there, I'm getting even more. So I'm going to say 1 plus 1.429 plus 0.7317 gives me 3.1607. So I'm going to say 3.1607. Now, uh, all these were really only good to one decimal place. So really, I'm back down to two sig figs. And that's going to be I1. Now, the 1.098, I've taken care of this term, I've taken care of this term, and I've taken care of this term. But the 1.098, I have to pull the 3.810 to the other side. That's going to become negative. So I'll say 1.098 minus 3.810. And that's going to give me negative 2.712. Again, with that one, really only one decimal place was appropriate. So I'm going to do that. And now I can say that I1 is equal to negative 2.712 divided by 3.1607. That's basically two sig figs divided by two sig figs. And that gives me negative 0 0.8580. So normally I try to tell my students, this is very important. Uh, when you are given a circuit to solve, you have to usually choose your own current directions and your own current names. If you get it wrong, it's not a big deal. So I don't want you wasting a single iota of time trying to decide which way it goes, unless you're just wanting to learn uh, how to get a feel for whether the uh, currents will be going left or right or something like that. Then you can use it like that and then correct yourself. But the main thing is all that's going to happen if you get it wrong is you're going to get a negative and then you have to keep using that negative until the pr problem's finished being solved. So in this case, we got 0 0.8580 uh, for I1. So that's one of the currents and it's negative. So whenever I go to plug it in, I got to plug in that negative value. Now I'm going to take uh, equation two prime and get I3. So from two prime, I get I3 is equal to 1.098 minus 0 0.7317 times I1, which is negative 0 0.858, whoa, 8580, like that. And this will give me 1.098 minus 0.7317 times negative 0 0.8580. That gives me 1.7258 amps. And that's actually equal to, this one was I1. I forgot to write that there. This one is I3. So now I have the current through uh, the middle wire. Now I'm going to use three prime to find two. 
I2. So I2 is going to be equal to 3.810 plus 1.429 times I1, which is negative 0 0.8580. That's 3.810 plus 1.429 times negative 0 0.8580. That gives me 2.5839. And that's I2. Any questions on that one? Now we're calling that 0 0.86, negative 0 0.86, 1.7 and 2.6 roughly. Uh, in fact, I should probably specify that really only one decimal place is good. So those are non-sig figs. But if we want to, we can look back at it and see uh, what results are quote unquote correct. I used the same problem as the book did. So this should have the exact same results. Let's check. They got I3 is 1.7. They got I2 is 2.6. And they got I1 is negative 0.87. I got 0.86. That's close enough. So yeah, we can see that it's essentially the same result. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so remember the big thing with Kirchhoff's loop rule and Kirchhoff's junction rule. The loop rule is the sum of all the currents into a junction is equal to the sum of all the currents out of the junction. And Kirchhoff's, uh, that's Kirchhoff's junction rule. Kirchhoff's loop rule is the sum of the voltage increases and decreases over any closed loop has to add up to zero. And you've got to remember that if you are traversing a wire in the same direction the current goes, then, and, that, and that's just the direction you chose, by the way, uh, then that resistor that you cross will be a voltage drop. But if you go the opposite way, it's going to be a voltage increase. So that's sort of what you got to keep an eye on that. And remembering that if you go uh, from the short leg to the long leg of a battery, that's a voltage increase. If you go from the long leg to the short leg, that's a voltage decrease. Let's try another one. So... This is another problem straight from your book, so we can actually work it out. Uh, what we're looking at here is they want us to compute the current through the starter motor when only the weak battery is connected. And then part B, they want us to do it again when both are connected. So we can see uh, what jumper cables are supposed to be like. Now, in this problem, they actually gave us the jumper cable, and they specifically gave us the dimensions of the jumper cable. So what I'm going to tell you is that RJ is equal to rho L over A. And now I'm going to quickly look up what the jumper cables were. And here it is. They did assume the starter cable, uh, the starter was a 0.15 ohm load. Each jumper cable is three meters long and half a centimeter in diameter. And it's copper, three meters and half a centimeter. So the jumper cable is copper. L is equal to 3.00 meters. And uh, D is equal to 0 0.500 centimeters. Notice I added my extra digits to make it all work out to be three sig figs. So I can now say RJ is equal to 1.68 times 10 to the negative 8 ohm meters. Remember, I happen to know that for copper. We used it just a few minutes ago. Then I'm going to say it's times 3.00 meters. And then I'm going to say all that uh, can be divided by pi times 0 0.500 times 10 to the negative 2 meters squared. 
and then I will multiply the top by four because we're using pi d squared over four. <laughs> so now I'll multiply this 1.68 e to the negative eight times three times four. Now I'm going to divide that by parentheses 3.14159 times 0.5e e to the negative two. Now I got to square that, close parentheses. That gives me 0 0.002566. And that's supposed to be ohms. So RJ is really a small resistance, 0 0.002566 six ohms and really we got no business using even with my three sig figs <laughs> using any more than that okay so that's something that's going to come in handy uh when we start it but right now we're going to start with part a so what i'm imagining here in part a is just this part of the circuit those these cables are not connected at all so I'm going to do Kirchhoff's loop rule, and I'll start right here between R2 and the weak EMF. And I'm going to go this way, which, by the way, is the direction of I2 and is the direction of I3. And there's no junctions here, so there's not much more to deal with. In fact, this is not even a, a Kirchhoff's loop rule thing, but it still works. It's just going to give us Ohm's law. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from here across here. I'm going from the short leg to the long leg. So that means my voltage will be a voltage increase. So I'm going to say plus 10.1. And then I'm going to say minus 0 0.15 I3. Now I'm back up to R2. And I'm going to say I'm going the same direction as I2. So I'll say minus 0 0.010 I2. Now I'm back where I started from. So I'm going to say equals 0. Any questions on that? Okay. Uh, since I called that I3, notice when I actually uh, said we're only using this part from here to here, this I2 and this I3 are all the same. So I can go ahead and make this correction and just call them both I2. So now that we don't have that more complex circuit drawn, I can call this 10.1 minus 0 0.26 I2 is equal to 0, which means I2 is equal to 10.1 divided by 0 0.26. So I2, which is the current through the starter engine, is 10.1 divided by 0.26. So that's going to be 38.85 amps going through the starter motor. Technically, I only had uh, two sig figs, so really I have to call that about 39 amps. So... That's through starter motor. Through the starter motor uh, without jump. In other words, without the other battery. Now we can do part B. And that's a little more complicated. Uh, we can see, for instance, that I1 and I2 come into junction B and I3 comes out. So I'm going to say equation one is I1 plus I2 is equal to I3. Now I'm going to take the outer loop 
No, I'll take the upper. The upper loop for Kierkegaard's uh, loop rule. Uh, I'll start at C. So what I'm doing for this upper loop is I'm starting at C. Oops. I'm starting at C and I'm going this way, this way, this way, and this way. So you can see I am going with the direction of I1 against the direction of I2. So that means I have to count the resistances along I2 as voltage increases, but the resistances along I1, I count them as voltage decreases. So I'll start, let's say I'll start right here instead of starting at C. So I'm going to go this way. That means I start off with a 12.5 volt jump. So I'll say plus 12.5. Now I'm going to say minus 0 0.002566 I1. Now I'm going at B. I'm hanging a left as seen, well actually a right as seen by that thing, or going to the left as seen by us. I go from the big leg of the battery to the short leg, so that's going to be a minus 10.1. And then I'm going opposite direction of the current, so this R2 is actually a voltage increase. So I'll say plus 0 0.010 times I2. Now I'm going up along A, uh, going through A and then going up from A to C, Again, going the same direction as the current. So that's going to give me another 0 0.002566 I1. And then that brings me to R1, which would be a minus 0 0.02 I1. And then I'm back to where I started. So I'll so say that's I uh, equal to 0. Now I can combine some like terms. So 0 0.002566. For instance, uh, I can multiply that by two. That'll take care of this one and this one. Now I got to add 0 0.02 to it. So plus 0 0.02. And now uh, that takes care of that one. So I'm going to say my new equation is 12.5 minus. 0 0.025132, I'll just say 13, that's more than enough, times I1. So now I've taken care of all the I1 terms. Uh, I, I should probably go ahead and subtract the 10.12. So 12.5 minus 10.1 gives me 2.4. So let me go ahead and fix that. I'm going to call this 2.4 instead of what we have. So that just took care of the 12.5 and the 10.1. Now all I have left is the positive. Oops. Now all I have left is the positive 0 0.010 I2 equals 0. So we're going to call that equation two. Now I'm going to do the same thing uh, with the outer loop. So let's say outer loop. Now, I, this is just a way that I found useful on these circuits. Sometimes I'll do the upper loop and the bottom loop. Sometimes I'll do the outer loop and the lower loop. Sometimes I'll do the upper loop and the uh, outer loop like I did here. It doesn't matter. Uh, there's really no quote unquote wrong way to solve it, uh, but you got to find a way. And in principle, if you get them all uh, in terms of uh, number times I1 plus number times I2 plus number times I3 equals a number, then you can even use matrix methods and, and that works really nice. But let's go ahead and do the outer loop now. I'm going to start at D on this one. And I'm going to go down this way, up, and then this way. Okay. 
So for the outer loop, I'm going to say, first off, I'm going the direction of I1. So I'm going to say minus, oops, let me put it on writing pen. I'm going to say minus 0 0.002566 I1. Uh, minus, notice I'm going the same direction as I3. So this is going to be a voltage drop, 0 0.15 I3. Now I'm going back up uh, RJ again. So this is minus 0 0.002566 I1. And now I've got to go through R1, but I'm going the same direction as I1. So that's a voltage drop again. So this is 0 0.020 I1. And then I've got a voltage increase of 12.5. So I'll say plus 12.5. I'm back to where I started, so I write equals zero. So now I'm going to combine like terms, 0 0.002566 plus 0 0.002566 plus 0 0.02. That gives me 0 0.02513, which we had before. So I'm going to say uh, 12.5. That took care of this term. And now I'm going to say uh, minus 0 0.02513 times I1. That takes care of this term, this term, and this term. So now all I have left is the I3 term. So I'm going to say minus 0 0.15 I3, all that's equal to zero, that's going to be equation three. If you'll notice, this one sort of has the same form as the last one. So by me doing it this way, I can solve it the exact same way. I can solve equation two for I2, I can solve equation three for I3, and then I can plug them all into equation two uh, and equation one. And that will get me basically an equation that only relates to I1. So we're going to do that. What I can do here is I can say I3 is equal to 12.5 minus 0 0.02513 I1 divided by 0 0.15. So that's one equation. I'm going to call that three prime. And I can say right here that this is going to be I2. So I2 is going to be uh, 0 0.02513. In other words, when I pull it over to the other side, it's going to be positive. And that's times I1 minus 2.4. And all that is going to be divided by 0 0.010. That's going to be 2 prime. Now, I can also write 3 prime this way. I3 is going to be equal to... Now, when I pulled I3, I actually pulled it to the other side. So that made the 12.5 positive and the other one negative. So that all works. So I'm going to take 12.5 and I'm going to divide it by 0.15. And that gives me 83.3. Finally got my 83.3 I was talking about. And now I'm going to say minus 0 0.02513 divided by 0 0.15. That's going to give me 0.1675. So 0 0.1675 times I1. Uh, we really are looking at uh, two sig figs here, so these extra digits are not that helpful. Uh, the two prime can be changed as well. I'm going to say 0 0.02513, and I'm going to divide it by 0 0.01, which is the same thing as multiplying by 100. So I'm going to get 2.513. Two point five one three I one, 
Now I'm going to take the 2.4 and divide it by 0 0.01. Again, that's multiplication by 100. So that's going to give me 240. So this will be minus 240. Okay. Now I can plug 2 prime and 3 prime into 1. And I get I1, because the first term is I1, plus I2, which would be 2.513 I1 minus 240. And then that's equal to I3, which we found was 83.33. Uh, minus 0 0.1675 I1. So I can combine all the I1s. On the left, I've got 3.5, and then I pull over another 0.16. So all that's going to be positive. So I'm going to say uh, 1 plus 2.513 plus 0.1675 equals 3.68. 0, 0.5 I1 and that took care of this term, this term and this term. Now the other side I'm going to add 240 to both sides and that'll take care of this term and this term. So 240 plus 83.33 is going to give me 323.33. So I'm going to say this is equal to 323.33. That tells me I1 is just equal to, so I'm dividing 323.33 by 3.6805, and that gives me 87.85. amps is I1. That's not one we were asked for. We were really just asked for I3, but we have it anyways, and we evidently chose the right uh, direction. Now I can say I3, oops. Now I can say I3 Notice that tells me I'm supposed to take 83.33 and I'm supposed to subtract from that 0.1675 times I1, which is 87.85. So 83 minus all that gives me 68.62. And that's I3. That's the one we really wanted to know. So I'll put a double box by that so we'll know. So remember, when we first did it, we only got 38 amps. Now we're getting like 68 amps. So that, that's pretty good. Uh, and then I2, of course, is 2.513 times 87.85. And then I'm going to subtract from that. Uh, 240. So I suspect that one might actually be uh, negative, and it is negative 19.23. So that's what I2 turned out to be. Anybody have any questions on that one? All right, let's go ahead and take a break at 6.57. Uh, let's come back at 7.05. I'll be here if you have any questions, but go ahead and take, you know, like eight minutes or so, and uh, we'll come back and get started on the next part, which is uh, a lot easier than this, trust me.
We've got about one minute left, everybody. All right, we should go ahead and get started. So I've talked to you a little bit about how capacitors uh, actually charge up when you connect them to a battery. Uh, in this case, your book actually takes the circuit that you see, see here with a little switch and just imagines you close the switch. And when doing so, you, you basically use Kirchhoff's loop rule. And that gives you basically that E minus... Now you got to turn it into voltage. So remember the capacitance equation says C equals Q over V. So V is equal to Q over C. So we're going to say plus E, the electromotive force, minus Q over C, or 1 over C times Q, minus IR is equal to zero. That readily turns into a differential equation, uh, specifically because you can say uh, I is dQ dt, and then you have a, a derivative with respect to time of Q, and then you also have a Q in it that's uh, multiplied by 1 over C, and so on and so forth. When you solve that differential equation, which you can find plenty of examples of it in your book, uh, they do it in the book, but you can also find plenty of examples of me doing it on my YouTube channel. Uh, main thing is when you solve that, you get these three expressions. The charge is going to initially, when you first close that switch, the battery is having that positive terminal on the battery is going to compel the, the pretend positive charges in the wire that are free to move. It's going to compel them to run away from that positive terminal of the battery, and they're going to run towards the bottom plate of the capacitor that you see up there that's going to slowly build up more and more positive charge. And the more positive charge that gets on the bottom plate, the more positive charge is, is compelled to leave the top plate and the uh, top plate is going to become negative. But you can see over time, that's going to grow basically to some net uh, charge that will ultimately, once the current stops flowing, then there will be no voltage drop IR across the resistor. So the entire voltage of the EMF, which is just that E, will be across the capacitance. So the charge would be C times E. And you can see that this equation is completely consistent with that because uh, C times E is multiplied by 1 minus E to the negative T over RC. As T approaches infinity, this term goes to zero, so Q approaches CE. Well, at the same time that the charge is increasing across the capacitor, the voltage will be increasing by the same way, so that's why these two equations look the same. But in that time, while the charges are actually building up, there's actually something equivalent to current, though we don't necessarily see any positive charges jumping the gap from the bottom plate to the top plate, we have something equivalent to it, namely the top plate uh, is being compelled to have all the negative or the positive charges move away as the bottom plate builds up the positive charges. So what we get is a current that falls off exponentially. So we get E over R, E to the negative T over RC. These equations are on your equation sheet. So your job is just to apply them. These are the equations for charging a capacitor. You'll see a different set of equations for discharging a capacitor, and you'll just need to know which ones are which. The hardest thing about this is students often don't know how to deal with exponents and logarithms and that sort of stuff. So that's why I wanted to take the time to show you at least one of these. You can look at the next one, which is for a discharging capacitor using different equations uh, if you want. I don't know that I'm going to... Uh, cover it. But anyways, first off, what we find is the time constant tau is equal to R times C. You should be able to convince yourself that the units of ohms times farads gives you actual seconds. Your book does that for you somewhere in it. So you can look for it there, but that's definitely something you should be able to show. What we're doing here is we're going to say 20.0 kilo ohms. 
and we're going to multiply it by 0 0.300 microfarads. Notice this is just like the book, but I made sure I added three sig figs, uh, made sure I had three sig figs for everything. Now, if I multiply uh, 20 times 0.3, that's the same thing as multiplying 2 times 3, so I get 6.00. That's the proper number of sig figs. But a kilo times a micro is 10 to the third times 10 to the negative six, which gives me 10 to the negative third. So this is 6.00 microseconds is the time constant. So that's the first part of the problem. Now for part B, in this case, they want to know what's the max charge. Well, uh, you can make a graph of this Q if you wanted. Uh, let me do it really quickly. Your book has some copies of it. Here's Q. Here's T. And this quantity right up here on the vertical axis is actually going to be C times E. And what we're going to see is the charge will asymptotically approach that like this. Okay. And you can even see, for instance, that the time constant RC gives you very specific examples of time. For instance, if you had uh, T equals 1 RC, if you put that in the equation for Q, you get RC over RC in the exponent. So it'd be E to the negative one. E to the negative one, by the way, is equal to 36.7%. But then I got to do one minus 36.7%. So I get 63.2%. So at one time constant, tau equals RC, this approaches 63.2% of CE. So what they're wanting to know is what's the max charge on C? That's going to be Q max. Oops. That's going to be Q max equals C times Z. And that C is 0 0.300. Oops. I wrote three of them. Microfarads times E, which is 12.0 volts. A volt times a farad gives me a coulomb. I can leave the micro in place, and that'll make it come out as, as uh, micro coulombs. Now, a 12 times 0.3 is the same thing as a 1.2 times 3. So this gives me 3.60 micro coulombs is Q max. So we have that, that's part B, and this is part A. For part C, they say, how long does it take to reach 99%? Uh, so what does that mean? Well, let me show you uh, what we're going to do, is we're going to take that equation Q, and we're going to set that to 0 0.990, meaning I'm using three sig figs, times CE, is equal to CE times 1 minus E to the negative T over RC. And that's the big part here, is just by doing that, you can see that the CEs cancel out. And then you can also see that you get E to the negative T over RC is equal to 0 0.0100. Because when I pull the 0.99 to the right, it becomes 1 minus 0.99, which is 0 0.01. And then I need three sig figs, so it's 0 0.0100. Now, to solve for time, I take the natural log of both sides, and I get the natural log of E to the negative T over RC is equal to the natural log of 0 0.0100. Now, the rule for the natural log is any log, log base B of X to the Y is equal to Y times log base B of X. 
Now, in this case, we have the extra advantage that uh, the log of the base is actually just one. Uh, I will give you an equation that comes in handy for uh, logarithms in a second. Uh, it's the single most useful equation for logarithms. But in general, what we now have is, oops. In general, what we now have is negative T over RC is equal to the ln of 0 0.0100. So we get T is equal to negative RC times the ln of 0 0.0100. Uh, we know that the RC is uh, 6.0 milliseconds, and the LIN of 0 0.01 is actually uh, negative 4.605. So if I take negative 4.605 and multiply it by 6, I get 27.63, and the negatives cancel out. So this would be 27.63 milliseconds. And that's one extra sig fig, and that's T to 99% Qmax. Which you can also realize is right at about 4.6. So 4.61 RC brings you to about 99%. Okay. Any questions on that one? So part D says, what is I when Q is equal to one half? So this is another tricky problem that they're, they're trying to sort of, it's not really that they're baiting you to try to make you make a mistake, but they're wanting you to learn to pay close attention. So in this case, they're saying, hey, I want to know what I is but I'm not going to ask you for a specific time. I'm going to tell you a criteria of what's going to happen. You're going to use that to find out what the time is, and then you're going to plug that into the time equation. That's what's going on here. So let's do that. This is part E. And what I have to figure out first is T for one half Q max, because that's what they're wanting to figure out. They're wanting to know what is I when Q is one half Q max. So I'll say one half CE is equal to CE times one minus E to the negative T over RC. You can again see that the CEs cancel out and this is gonna give you a uh, negative T over RC is equal to the natural log of one half because when the one half comes over to the right hand side, it's gonna be one minus one half, and the E is gonna to come to the left hand side, and that's gonna be E to the negative T over RC. When you take the ln, you're gonna get negative T to the RC out in front, and then a ln of E, which is just one. So this is ultimately what happens. So I can say T one half Q max is equal to negative RC ln of one half. So the RC is 6.00 milliseconds. I've got a negative out in front of that. Uh, you probably already know that the ln of uh, one half is 0 0.6931, negative 0 0.6931 is the natural log of one half just like the natural log of two is 0 0.6931. So those two negatives multiplying give you a positive. And this gives me 4.159 milliseconds, which is on the order of, obviously, uh, well, in this case, it's obviously it's about 69% of the time constant. So we have that, that's one extra, dang it. We have that and that includes one extra sig fig here. Now that I have that time, I can plug it into I to find out that I of 4.159 milliseconds is equal to uh, 
uh, E over R. So we say E over R times E to the negative T over RC. That's what's supposed to be I. Actually, let me go ahead and write that first before I write all this stuff. I'm going to say I of T is equal to E over R times E to the negative T over RC. Now I want I of 4.159 milliseconds well e is 12.0 volts and r is 20.0 kilo ohms a volt divided by a kilo ohm is a milli a milliamp so we're going to get a milliamp as the unit but now i'm going to take e and instead of writing 4.159 and then writing rc is six seconds i can just write negative 0 0.6931 for the time because that's really what we had to do. We had to do 0 0.6931 times RC divided by RC. So if it makes you feel any better, you could write the RC up top and then write the RC on the bottom and then just cross them out so you'll know what happened. So I'm going to take E to the point negative 0 0.6931. Anybody think they know what that answer is going to be? E to the negative 0 0.6931 is going to give me one half. Okay. So that's just one half of 12 divided by 20 which is obviously 0.6. So this is gonna be I, oops. This is gonna be I of 4.159 milliseconds is equal to 0 0.300 milliamps. Anybody have any questions on that? Now you want to know what I max is. I max occurs when T is equal to zero. That's when the most current can actually flow. If you actually looked at a graph of T for of I, for instance, versus T, what you'd get is uh, basically the current goes like this. And this quantity right here is E over R. So E over R really is the max current, and that's 600 milliamps. So we can say F I max is equal to E over R, which, by the way, equals I of 0, 0.0 seconds. And that's equal to 0 0.600 amps, which equals 600.0 milliamps. Any questions on that one? So now in F, they're asking, what is Q? when I is only 20% of I max. So if you took a zero point, oh, actually, let me write it in blue again. So we're going to say E is going to start right here. I want 0 0.200 E over R is equal to E over R times E to the negative T over RC you can see that the E over R cancels out in both cases. And uh, now we can say that the natural log of 0.2 is equal to, again, I wanna be writing in blue. So I'll take the natural log of both sides and that's equal to negative T over RC. So that tells me T is going to be equal to negative RC times the natural log of 0 0.200.
Now the RC, remember, is just six milliseconds, and Lynn is going to give us a negative as well. So uh, Lynn point two gives me negative one point six zero nine times six. That gives me nine point six five seven. seconds okay now you might suspect that when i gets to point two of its max then probably q is point eight of its max so that's just something you want to think about physically does that make sense does that seem reasonable and then let's check the answer and see what happens now i can say q of 9.657 seconds is equal to, now I just plug in that whole formula again. I've got to take C times E, so that's 0. 0.3 times 20, or excuse me, times 12. That's clearly going to give me, uh, that's actually, C is 0. 0.3, yeah, that's right, 0. 0.3 microfarads times 12, which would be 3.6 microcoulombs. So that's 3.6 microcoulombs times 1 minus E. Now, in this case, I'm going to say the lin of 0.2 is 1.609. So this is just negative 1.609 RC over RC. And that answer becomes... One minus, now I'm going to write E to the negative 1.609. That gives me, in fact, 80%. So that's uh, 0 0.8 of RC. So that's exactly what I thought it would be. And we'll call that 2.880. Microcoulombs. And that's the final answer. But note it is, in fact, 0.8. The I and the Q and the I and the V are sort of on opposite things. One is starting off with C, E, or E, and slowly the exponential is taking it away, uh, making it smaller, in other words, or the, making the difference between it and C, E smaller. Whereas E or I is just immediately decaying. So uh, when you find 0.2 of I, you're finding 0.8 of Q and 0.8 of V. So hopefully that helps you. Uh, anybody have any questions on that? So that's how you work those problems. Now let me give you the actual equations for discharging. So you can also discharge a capacitor. As you might suspect, uh, the charge would decay exponentially. So you might suspect Q is equal to uh, Q0. So what we're imagining here is someone took a battery and charged up a capacitor, and then they disconnected the battery, and then just connected the battery in series with an actual bat uh, with an actual resistance, and they've got a switch separating them, uh, so the circuit won't start um, distributing charges around it until the switch is closed. So in this case, it's going to be whatever the initial charge is times e to the negative t over R C. That's going to be one of the equations. And of course, uh, you can see that the voltage is going to do the same thing. And the voltage is going to be a V0, but we can also say that's going to be basically Q over C. So we can call this Q0 over whatever the capacitance is, and that would be times E to the negative T over RC. So uh, assuming that the charge and the voltage decay exponentially, you'd expect this to be the result. And then the current in this case is actually going to start off at zero and then climb. If you want to look at that in your book, I'm going to flip it over. Y'all can see right now we're looking at this 
this is all the stuff we just uh, finished doing. Uh, I'm going to go to the next set now, which is discharging a capacitor. Now, the big thing with discharging a capacitor is, again, you use the same differential equation, but in this case, I is negative dQ dt, so the differential equation comes out different. So you do get this, uh, this Q equals Q0 e to the negative t over RC. V is equal to V0 e to the negative t over RC. And then you get the I is actually going to exponentially decay as well because the current is actually going to start off uh, at some high value because it just looks to the to the capacitor like, hey, I've got a positive plate and I've got this empty wire that's free to make charges move. So lo and behold, we get E uh, or excuse me, we get I is, dang it, I did the wrong one. We get I is equal to basically Q0 over RC times E to the negative T over RC. So I is going to get Q0 over RC times E to the negative T over RC. So those are your three equations you have to do for uh, discharging a capacitor. Okay. Now, if you run into a homework problem from chapter 26, uh, what I want you to know, let me double check my number there. Yes, from chapter 26, uh, what, what you want to know is when you're doing the homeworks, if you run into a problem about uh, making a voltmeter out of a uh, galvanometer or making an ammeter out of a galvanometer, you just want to look at the example in the last section, next to the last section of the book, and that'll walk you through it. Uh, I'm not going to test you on it, but it will appear possibly in your homeworks, even though I'll try to scrub most of them out. Uh, but I don't mind, and I normally would have you do such a thing, and I think it's a really valuable thing because it turns out it turns out that in nature you're sometimes going to have voltages or currents that are too big for your multimeters, uh, so you end up having to do the same thing as if the multimeter uh, was a galvanometer. You can just, again... Uh, in the case of measuring a really big current, you might have to put a shunt resistance around it and, and stuff like that. So that's really what's going on here. But we've now completed chapter 25, uh, 26. Uh, voltmeter and ammeter. Oops. Made from galvanometer. Oop. will not be tested. Okay. So as I said, you should always read all your book as much of you, as you can. Uh, but the main thing is we're now moving on to chapter 27. And I think the most important thing from chapter 27 is uh, basically we're going to introduce the idea of uh, magnetism uh, the word magnetism comes from a place in Asia Minor that we know as modern-day Turkey, a place called Magnesia. And at that location there, you could find stones that would actually attract each other. So you'd pick up a rock and you pick up another rock and these two rocks would feel some compulsion to run into each other or to sometimes repel to one another. And it was, you know, you can imagine if you first found that, that would seem like magic, especially to a, a child, for instance, who'd never seen it. And, and that was magnetism. It was action at a distance and it looked really strange. So they knew enough to name it. Yeah. And we called it mag magnetism. And what it turns out to be is basically uh, you can sort of say that all matter is made up of atoms or molecules and all those atoms and molecules have electrons that orbit around the nucleus of the atom 
within the molecule as well as the atom all by itself. That is essentially like a current going in a circle, like a, a, a wire in a shape of a circle with a current running through it. And if you actually make a current in a wire that goes in a circle, you actually find that the wire makes a magnetic field. In fact, uh, just if you take a, let's see, this uh, pin right here, notice it's pointing up. If you imagine this was a wire and pointing up meant that the current was going that way, then there's a nice right-hand rule that you can see at the beginning of chapter 27, but is a nice right-hand rule where you take your thumb of your right hand and you point it in the direction of the current, and then you curl your fingers around, and then you look at the way those fingers are curled, and from my perspective, when I look at it, I see my fingers are curled around in a counterclockwise direction. So that means if I'm looking down on the wire and the current is coming up towards my forehead, then I expect the magnetic field to be going around the wire in a plane perpendicular to the wire in a counterclockwise circle. Now, that seems kind of weird, but let me show you what I mean by that on this uh, on this iPad. So imagine this is our wire right here. The current's coming out of the page. So I'll put a little dot in the middle because then it looks like the point or the tip of an arrow, right? The tip of an arrow would have a little sharp spot dead center and it'd just be a circle. Whereas the back of an arrow, like in a bow and arrow, that would have the little feathers sticking out and I would draw it sort of like this. We're not drawing that though. We're drawing the other way because we have the current coming out. So when I say a right hand rule, I'm imagining the current coming out of the page and then the magnetic field is going around in a uh, counterclockwise direction. So what I'm gonna do is imagine drawing a circle like this sorta. Of. Now that was a particularly ugly circle and I'm very unproud of it, but I'm going to try to center it up as best I can. Yeah, I'm trying to make a circle whose center is the center of the wire. So that's pretty close. Now, what this means is if we take this point right here to the left or to the right of the wire, then uh, at that point, the magnetic field would point that way. If I take this point right here, the magnetic field would point this way. If I take this point right here, the magnetic field would point that way. And if I take this point right here, the magnetic field would point that way. The symbol we use for the magnetic field is B. And it turns out that B is actually going to be equal to mu zero I over two pi R, where R is the distance between the center of the current carrying wire to the circle that we drew. And mu zero is called the permeability of free space. And its value is four pi times 10 to the negative seventh Tesla meters per amp. So that's what the mu zero is. The I is the current. And you see what the T is. So that's one of the right hand rules that we have. Now, it's also going to help you to understand exactly, you know, what does the magnetic field do to try to make a force? Well, it turns out the magnetic field can act on a, uh, it can be created by a current carrying wire. And you see that the formula for an infinitely long straight current carrying wire is mu zero I over two pi R. Uh, but it also turns out that a magnetic field can put a force on a wire and a magnetic field can put a force on a charge as long as the charge is moving. So, uh, the force, oh, the force on a charge Q with 
velocity v is given by f is equal to q times v cross b. So that's the actual formula for the force caused by a magnetic field. Notice if V is equal to zero, you get no force. Okay. And that cross product is, yeah, that's really the cross product. The, the one you do with the determinant of a matrix and so on and so forth. Uh, if you want to know the force on a wire, on a current carrying is F is equal to the current times the length. So we pretend that the length of the wire is a vector. In other words, we make it straight for starters, that helps. And then we multiply, we make sure the vector points in the same direction as the current and we multiply that that vector by i to get a current uh, or a vector whose length is i times l. And then we take the cross product of that with b, and that gives us our famous bill equation, f equals bill, okay? Uh, which is the way you'd write it without vector symbols. You'd say b times l times the sine of the angle theta, where theta is the angle between the... Uh, the L vector and the B vector when the L vector and B vector are uh, tail to tail. Notice that I times L has units of coulombs, meters per second, and so does Q times V, coulombs, meters per second. So I times L has the same units as Q times V, which are coulombs times meters per second. And that should make a little bit more sense uh, you can also, if you have a wire or a magnetic field that changes orientation and strength and stuff like that, you can make it a little bit more complex by saying the differential force on a little differential element of wire DL is equal to IDL cross B. So that's another uh, famous equation that we can make use of. I will also tell you that uh, we can say the Lorentz force is F is equal to Q times E plus Q times V cross B, which is often just written as Q times E plus V cross B. So that's another famous equation that, that pairs it up in case you have an electric field and a magnetic field. Anybody have any questions on that? All right. So uh, what I'm going to tell you is the magnetic field in SI units is the Tesla. And of course, that's named after Nikolai Tesla, not the car. <laughs> okay. Uh, the car is named after Nikolai Tesla, who was a brilliant man, but he's also got a bit of a cult following and a bunch of crazy people follow him. In fact, I, I bought what it seemed like a perfectly normal biography of, of uh, uh, Nikolai Tesla written by Margaret Cheney. And uh, everything was going fine. She was talking about some good science stuff and all the cool inventions you made. And then she said, even though uh, Tesla did not believe he had magical powers, of course he did. <laughs> so, so, so this person literally just thinks, you know, Tesla was magic, which, I mean, if you don't understand the technology, you don't understand the science or whatever. Yeah, everything looks like science, uh, looks like magic. But uh, anyways, that that's the kind of following we have with Tesla. So there's all sorts of crazy conspiracy theories behind him and stuff like that. I will tell you, he was brilliant, okay? Uh, and he was really ripped off by Edding, uh, by Arthur Eddington. No, not by Arthur Eddington. Uh, he was ripped off by, I don't even know why Eddington came into my mind. He was ripped off by uh, Alexander Graham Bell, and he was also ripped out, off by Westinghouse. Uh, both of them uh, ended up stealing 
hundreds and hundreds of his patents, maybe even on the orders of thousands of his patents. And he died quite poor, but luckily a uh, nice hotel owner allowed him to live rent free uh, in one of the upper floors of his apartment. And he just lived in there and fed his pigeons till the day he died. Uh, he left the, the window open day and night so the pigeon could come in and come out. But he was a neat character. He was probably six foot five, weighed about 82 pounds, I think. And not only that, he wore uh, walked around in cork bottom shoes uh, that were about six inches tall. So the actual soles of the shoes were like six inches tall because you never know when you're going to have to do a, a neat experiment demonstration with electricity and magnetism. And the only way you can stay safe is if you're isolated from ground. So he wore that kind of stuff. Another unit of the magnetic field is also the Gauss. And for instance, the Earth's magnetic field is about a half a Gauss. And a Gauss is about, uh, well, about 10,000 Gauss make one Tesla. If you talk about an MRI, they're usually on the order of a whole Tesla. Some of the ones we use for experiments in physics are on the order of two Tesla or something like that. Uh, I will also say that the north magnetic pole of the Earth is actually a south magnetic pole. And you should know that because the north pole of a compass, which is a magnet, <laughs> points towards the North Pole of the magnetic North Pole. So uh, North only points towards South and South only points towards North. Opposite poles attract and light poles repel. Now I've given you enough uh, background information to go through chapter 27 and to start solving physics problems. So you guys are free to go. Uh, please watch your email very closely. I'm getting ready to make some big announcements of stuff that you're going to do to be able to improve your score. So pay close attention to your emails. Uh, I'm talking, you know, check them twice a day, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. So keep an eye on them. You guys are free to go. Thanks for coming. And I'll wait here till the last person leaves in, in case anybody has any questions. That's the youngest. Yeah, John, how's it going? It's going good. Uh, so I had sent you an email, but uh, Professor Raskovich said that I should um like talk to you after class instead of waiting on an email. Okay. Uh, Let me, I'll be pause this. You, you don't. I assume you won't. Whatever you're going to uh, say, you don't want to record it on the internet, right? Yeah. Okay. Let me do stop share, and then I'll stop recording too.